I'm Chuck Boyd, chairman of the board of this uh, prestigious think tank, and I'll be presiding today for what I think is going to be one of our more fundamentalist sessions. Ukraine has slipped on my radar scope uh, beyond the short range cursor. Um, face of intention of North Korea and Syria and all sorts of other things. But in the last couple of months, it seems to me, have picked up a little bit in tempo. And so, an update for me, Mr. Ambassador, there. <laughs> Um, is in order, and maybe for everybody else, since this is a pretty good crowd. And the man to do that, I had, uh, I think last night with John Abbasay, that uh, told him for this session today, and he said there's nobody better to give you a current appraisal uh, of what's going on in Ukraine than Kurt Volk. So he is here today with us. read your biography and his accomplishments, it would take the next 20 minutes or so, but he uh, has a broad bandwidth in government, intelligence, and diplomacy, and the White House, NATO, an organization with which I have some familiarity, the private sector, the financial uh, world, uh, currently then in academia, Institute out of ASU. Ambassador Volker can speak as long as he wishes, but I hope he'll leave a lot of time for Q&A from this curious crowd, and he's on the record, so uh, you can do with it as you will. Mr. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much for the kind introduction, appreciate it. Zal, Dimitri, Paul, thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, and I thought I would just talk a little bit, just to kind of give, as you said, a quick update and really engage in a dialogue as to where we are. Uh, the, um, I guess I'll start here. Uh, the conflict in Ukraine is still ongoing, and this is an important point for people to understand. It's not a frozen conflict. It's not static, it's not stable. Um, there is fighting every night. Uh, mortars, t uh, tank rounds, sniper fire, artillery. On average, a Ukrainian soldier is killed about every three days uh, defending the territory of his country inside the territory of his country. So if you can imagine what that would be like here, that would be somebody in Texas fighting and dying about every three days against an invasion in Texas. So it's very, very much a hot war and very traumatic for the country and, and very difficult politically. That has had significant humanitarian consequences. You've had about 10,000 people killed. You have displaced persons, estimates vary, but uh, in the direction of two million people displaced. Most of them successfully absorbed into other parts of Ukraine or just having picked up and left and gone to Russia or Belarus or elsewhere. So they're not as they're not as visible as Syrian refugees in Europe, but a couple million people is still a significant number. And uh, because of the conflict, the people in the contested area, in the area that Russia's occupying, are subject to a lot of privation. Uh, shut off so cell phone service is the latest thing. Uh, sometimes it's water, sometimes it's electricity, sometimes it's gas. Uh, in order to collect a pension payment, you have to go into the Ukrainian uh, controlled territory, which means crossing a dangerous ceasefire line or uh, going around by way of Russia. Uh, people uh, who, have, who are able to leave, many of them have left, and so you're dealing with a more vulnerable population than is really behind. So it's both a hot war and a significant humanitarian uh, issue, right in you know right in Europe, right there. <laughs> it's you know a couple hours flight uh, from Munich. Um, it, it's uh, it's really striking. The effort to resolve the conflict is the Minsk agreements, 
which were signed in 2014 uh, by Russia and Ukraine and the OSCE. And they have a process of working groups trying to get them implemented every couple of weeks in Minsk. Nothing's happening. And the political effort to cajole the implementation of these agreements is the Normandy process, which is France and Germany trying to nudge Russia and Ukraine. Um, they have periodic meetings at the foreign minister level, political director level of the foreign ministry, uh, presidential offices, uh, national security advisors, things like that. Again, nothing's happening. I mean, you can you can find small issues like um, fixing the bridge at this particular boundary crossing point, or a so-called back to school ceasefire in September, which reduced the nightly number of ceasefire violations from about 1,500 to about 200 for a couple of days, uh, and then back up again. The, the basic contours haven't changed. The basic contours are that Russia leads a military force in eastern Ukraine, occupies that territory, and has set up political entities called the Luhansk People's Republic and the Donetsk People's Republic, and is using those as a way of trying to claim some distance from the conflict and as if there is a legitimacy to an internal strife there, which, which is all a creation. What I was asked to do by Secretary of State Tillerson uh, last summer was to get the U.S. re-engaged in trying to resolve the conflict. And in particular, what I uh, asked for and received was a clear U.S. policy statement of what our goals are. And the goals are to restore Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity and to help to ensure the safety and security of all Ukrainian citizens regardless of ethnicity, nationality, or religion. A couple reasons why those policy positions are important. <coughs> One of them is that Russia continues to deny publicly its activities and presence in Ukraine. So, and it has technically signed up to the restoration of Ukraine's territorial integrity through the Minsk agreements. So we want to be clear that the goal is actually the restoration of, of that uh, territorial integrity. And secondly, the Russians claim that Russian-speaking people or ethnic Russians in Ukraine are somehow under threat and therefore need protection which is a justification for Russia's uh, involvement. And if, that's, if that were the case, it would be important that we also be on that side. Everybody should be safe, whether you're Russian, Ukrainian, or Tatar, or whatever. So it's important to adopt that goal. The reality is, of course, that there are ethnic Russians, Russian-speaking people throughout Ukraine they're perfectly fine, they're not threatened, they're not insecure, they're not discriminated against, they do quite well. The only place in Ukraine where Russian-speaking people face security problems is where the Russian forces are. <laughs> and that's because they generate a conflict, which is then putting pressure on that population. What we have tried to do um, is get Russia's attention and focus Russia on its choices. Uh, this takes several shapes. One of them is to increase the clarity with which we deal with the issue. Uh, up until last summer, there was a lot of opaqueness in the language as to how we would deal with or talk about the conflict. We would say things like the conflict in Ukraine without reference to Russia, just saying, well, just there just happens to be a conflict. Some people talked about ethnic conflict, which is not the case. Uh, people talked about uh, separatists, which, yes, there are now separatists, but they are there at the uh, creation and control of Russia. Uh, people talked about, euphemistically, the NGCA, uh, which I had to stop for a moment and think about, what is this? Um, and that refers to the non-government controlled area, which is a really elaborate way of avoiding saying the Russian occupied area. 
because that's really what it is. There's a Russian-occupied area, and there's a Ukrainian-controlled area. Uh, so we tried to increase the clarity of this to remove any plausibility of Russia's denial of its involvement here. It is Russia that is directing this. Uh, another thing we've done is to shore up the sanctions regimes, both in, in, the, in the EU, which has a rollover process every six months of rolling over sanctions, and in the U.S., and making sure that we remain as coordinated as possible. Not easy, but we, we are doing that. And then we've also lifted the restrictions on arms sales to Ukraine that were put in place by the Obama administration, which I think is very important because there is a, what I view as an artificial distinction between lethal and non-lethal military equipment. The, to give you an example, a counter-battery radar, as provided by the Obama administration, allows you to identify where mortar fire is coming from and improve your targeting so that you can attack and kill whatever is shooting at you much more easily. That's non-lethal. And an anti-tank missile, which sits in a box and doesn't get used unless you have a tank coming at you, is lethal. And so one is clearly, well, they're both clearly defensive weapons. One is clearly not going to get used unless there is a further Russian intervention in Ukraine. Um, and that was considered off limits. So we've lifted the restrictions and have increased the security assistance and defensive weapon assistance to Ukraine, which I think is terribly important. What this aims to show on the one hand is that Russia is not going to make further gains in Ukraine territorial, territorially. That, that, that is not. Um, they are where they are. That means that they are stuck with the costs of what they've already taken. And here the costs are significant. They have sanctions from the European Union, sanctions from the US. It's been made very clear from President Trump on down that there won't be an improved US-Russia relationship without resolving this conflict. Um, no real EU-Russia relationship. Uh, they pay the some of the cost of civil administration in the area. They have the cost of the military operation, um, which is, you know, th those expenses are probably about $5 billion a year put together. And it's all for nothing. Uh, because I think what Russia really wanted out of this was to change the government in Kiev or to reestablish a Russia-friendly Ukraine. But in fact, they produced the opposite. They produced a more unified, more nationalist, more Western-oriented Ukraine than ever existed. And they have particularly lost a younger generation in Ukraine, where people have now gelled in an opinion that you can't trust Russia Russia is taking our territory, we have to defend ourselves, we have to fight back, and we have to do everything we can to connect to Europe. And so that that psychological change in Ukraine is significant and uh, is much deeper than I think Russia ever anticipated it would be. I think Russia also expected the transatlantic community to divide and to not have any staying power on sanctions because that's what happened after they invaded Georgia. But that's not what happened this time. Uh, I think uh, we have faced a much stiffer response uh, from the EU and the US, and that's continuing. So there's no gain to be had, and there are costs. And what we then tried to do is to develop a way of getting Russian forces out, but to guarantee the implementation of the Minsk agreements, which require some political steps on Ukraine's part. And this includes uh, special status for territory in eastern Ukraine. It includes amnesty for people who committed crimes as part of uh, conflict. Uh, it includes the holding of local elections. And these are things that Ukraine is prepared to do. They've agreed to them in the Minsk agreements. They've passed uh, a number of pieces of legislation that tee this up, but they're not fully implemented, largely because there's no security and they can't access the territory. What we've proposed is for a UN-mandated peacekeeping force to go in and replace Russian forces, replace the separatist entities, and create a secure space for a period of time where you can have local elections, where amnesty will be granted, where special status is granted. And at the end of that process, 
then the territory would be restored back to Ukrainian control as per the Minnesota Agreements. So that's the, that's the theory. <coughs> we have been at this now for about seven months, and I have to say I'm very pleased with the positioning, but I'm not pleased with results because there aren't any results. Um, we have, I think, strengthened a, and, and made clear a U.S. policy here, which is important, and enjoys bipartisan support. Uh, we have kept the U.S. and France and Germany closely connected and dealing with them as they lead the Normandy process. We've also kept the EU and the U.S. and, and NATO all around the same set of policies as well. We've been in very close coordination with Ukraine so that uh, it's, they are reassured that no one is cutting deals over their heads about their own country, that they are fully engaged. And we presented the Russians with a unified position with options for how this can be resolved. Uh, my last meeting, I've had four meetings with my Russian counterpart, Vladislav Sokov. The last one was in January. And I would describe it as a very constructive meeting. Um, we are very disappointed and frustrated that Russia has not done anything to resolve the conflict in this six month period, seven month period. But I think they have taken careful note of what we're prepared to do. We talked a lot about um, how we can get from here to there. And uh, the Russian side took on board to produce a paper that they would come back to, they would come back to us with ideas on how to put this together and uh, to seek a further meeting when they're ready to do that. My assumption is that we'll get through President <coughs> re-election first, and then we'll come back to this. That's what I assume will happen. Uh, we've not heard uh, back from the Russians in the past month, but that's kind of what I expected. Uh, we'll see where, where we hear from them in the, in the coming weeks to month. That's it. That's it. Let me ask you just one quick thing before we turn it over to, to uh, our guests. In, in, in your discussions with other aspects of this issue, is Crimea a part of your discussions or is that completely off the table? Yeah, so a couple things about Crimea. <coughs> One of them is that there is not active fighting going on around Crimea. So the humanitarian urgency and the, the, the issue of conflict is a little bit less acute there than it is with Eastern Ukraine. Um, second, uh, I made it clear in our very first meeting that we don't accept Russia's invasion, occupation, and, and claimed annexation of Crimea. And put it on to, you know, I was asked to propose an agenda for our talks that was in the subject line, the conflict in Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. Uh, Russian side had objected and said, no, we're, we're not going to talk about Russian Crimea. And uh, we have been discussed it a little bit at the meeting, made clear that we're just not going to agree on this. My view on this is that we can't accept Russia's claim to Crimea. We, we have to stand in opposition to that. We also shouldn't let our disagreements on this prevent us from trying to resolve the conflict in eastern Ukraine if we can. So it's, it's I understand people could say, oh well, then you're basically accepting this annexation. Uh, but my view is uh, we, we're not accepting it and that sh the fact that we're not going to agree on this now shouldn't stop us from trying to and the conflict elsewhere. And Poroshenko is, is with you on this. Very much so. Yeah. This, this I think, is... We, we, no, no Ukrainian... This is an interesting point. No Ukrainian politician can, in public, or private, but certainly not in public, take a position other than insisting on the full restoration of all Ukrainian territory. To do so, to say something like that, would be uh, political suicide. Uh, there is a degree of realism about Crimea is not going to be restored anytime soon, and the conflict in eastern Ukraine is is acute. Uh, so that's how I would put that. Very well. All right, so please, um, please identify yourself and your affiliation. Um, ask your question. <coughs> 
So the floor is right here, sir. Thank you, Josh Rogan. Thanks, Josh Rogan, Washington Post. Thanks for your time today, and thank you for your service. Uh, what happens if Putin doesn't win? I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Um, my question is about what the Russians get in exchange for playing along. The idea is that they would really they would get relief from the sectoral sanctions that apply to eastern Ukraine, but not the Crimea sanctions. At the same time, we have the caste sanctions which are hanging over this whole thing. So how does that play into this? Mm -hmm. How can we give them or offer them credible sanctions relief when the president and the administration is under a lot of pressure to impose a whole new round of sanctions right. that could get in the way of that. And how does that factor into your discussions? Thank you. Right. Yeah. Um, first off, I think it is clear in the way sanctions were developed. And there are those that are related to Crimea, those that are related to Eastern Ukraine, those that are related to interference in elections and things like that. Uh, Magnitsky, another category. So. The ones that are Minsk related are ones that we would be lifting, advocating lifting and indeed lifting, if the Minsk agreements were fully implemented. That is probably more significant when it applies to Europe doing the same thing than the US doing the same thing. And I think it's worth it to Russia to get those lifted. Um, my understanding, and maybe some of you here have much closer ties in Moscow these days than I do, uh, but my understanding is there are a lot of business people in Russia who are very, very frustrated with lost opportunities. Um, they may not be paying an immediate cost today, but there's a lot that they are not doing. And they, they find that their opportunities for making money, building international contacts, diversifying, protecting their assets are shrinking. And I think that's very, very concerning to them. And getting the Minsk related sanctions lifted would be a, a signal change in where things stand. And I think that would be important. I do agree with part of what's implied in your question is that Russia is going to be very skeptical about US sanctions for as they look at the 98 votes in the Senate that voted the last time, saying no one's going to be in a mood to lift sanctions. Um, that, may be, that may be right, but I would also play it the other way around. Uh, if you take a look at the broad spectrum of U.S.-Russia issues, we have the fighting in Syria, we have North Korea, we have bilateral mill-to-mill -mill friction we have a diplomatic dispute. Uh, in fact, this might be an area where we actually could agree. And so it would be good to have something in the, in the positive side of the ledger. About tax sanctions? You know, I don't have any particular comment on those. They're, they're out there. Um, I think one of the things I interpret here is that this is in large measure about who has the pen. Uh, I think there, there is in every administration a desire to keep control. Uh, it's executive branch privilege. The Congress always seeks to have more control, <coughs> legislative prerogative. And I don't think there's a fundamental disagreement in goals, but there is a disagreement over who controls and then the tactical use of that based on who has control. Ambassador Burt. Uh, Burt, you didn't say too much about internal oh, dynamics. Oh, mm -hmm. so you didn't say too much about internal dynamics. <laughs> and I guess I have a sort of two-part question. First, uh, Ukraine has a, an election, I think, 2019. Uh, I'm told that Poroshenko's popularity in the polls are roughly three, per, three or four percent. But apparently there aren't many other challengers that get more in the polls, so it's a very murky, difficult situation. But I assume there will be a number of names from the past, as well as some new names that will emerge in this process. So uh, how does the sort of, let's call it fragmented character uh, of Ukrainian politics affect this? And the second part is uh, what appears to be just the, uh, in endemic problem of corruption 
which nobody seems to be able to do much about, which, uh, which wouldn't matter maybe if there wasn't a potentially weariness, particularly on the part of our European friends in the situation there and their continuing support economically for Ukraine as well as for the sanctions. So, you know, I'm just reminded of so many different uh, high-level American visits to Kiev and uh, table pounding on corruption and, and lack of follow-through. So what are your thoughts on that aspect? Mm -hmm. Those are all important questions. Uh, I'm reminded of a joke that Senator McCain told um, when the popularity of the Congress was single digits. And he said, you know, we're, we're down to uh, paid staff and blood relatives. Um, but then he got a call from his mother, 103 years old at the time, and said, it's just paid staff now. <laughs> <laughs> um, in Ukraine, I don't think there is a single politician who would be a candidate for president, um, viable candidate for president with popularity over 12%. So I think Timoshenko is about 12. I think I think Poroshenko is about nine. I think Boyko is less than that. Um, there is this rock star out at Stanford named Bakarchuk, who hasn't made clear if he's going to run or not, and it's very unclear what would happen if he did. Uh, there is um, there is the potential for instant popularity because he's not one of the other people. <laughs> And, uh, and he has some personal popularity. And then there's also the potential for not getting anywhere in election because of the need to actually have um, money and structure and so forth in an election campaign. I think the, the real dynamic here is the disappointment that people have after the Maidan. In 2014, there were great aspirations, great hopes that finally, there is going to be a transformation in the way Ukraine is governed. It's going to be a, a more promising, more Western, more democratic, less corrupt, and all of that. And three and a half years on, it's the same cast of characters, and it, and it kind of feels kind of the same as to how politics is. Right. 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 And the same thing happened with the Orange Revolution. Exactly. Um, some of that is unrealistic expectations. You know, just people have that. Uh, some of it is that things haven't gone far and fast enough. When you come down to an election, I think it, it comes down not to popularity, it comes down to choices. Who, who do you vote for? And I think you are likely to see uh, those people now in the single digits you know, being pretty closely vying for presidency, uh, which means 51% is what you would need to win. Um, in terms of reform, you have to acknowledge that the past three years have been the, the most successful period of reform in Ukraine in 25 years. Uh, and they have done all kinds of things that we would find difficult, like pass health care reform um, or pension reform. Social Security here, um, education reform, uh, creation of a special prosecutor's office, an investigatory office. Um, they have uh, strengthened the central bank. They reformed NAFTA gas. They have eliminated a couple of big areas of corruption, such as VAT refunds. They improved that. However, you have to say that this is not far enough. Uh, there are a couple of big things that are on the agenda of the IMF and the Western community that they really want to see Ukraine do. One of them is pass an independent uh, anti-corruption court, pass that legislation to establish that. This would complete a circle where you have a prosecutor, an investigatory office, and a court, all that would be independent, that would be able to uh, go after corruption cases. Um, that is not moved. Uh, it's in the parliament. Uh, there's a bill in the parliament. The Venice Commission and the IMF are not satisfied with the contents of the bill. It can be amended in the RADA. Very unclear what's actually going to happen. Uh, 
The other is privatization. And there's still a lot of state-owned industry that has not been privatized, and, and that does create opportunities for mischief. I would say that I think corruption is a very broad label uh, because there's all kinds. And I think the most significant thing is maybe not even what you would call corruption, but the, the structure of the economy right now where uh, a handful of people control most of what's strategic in the country. Uh, so it might only be 20 to 25% of GDP, but it is almost everything that matters. <laughs> And that, I think, is a problem because that is a huge barrier to foreign investment, to diversification of the economy, to competition. And that's what holds Ukraine's business climate back, and that's what holds the, the economy back. It should be growing much faster than it is. It's probably a percent and a half now, and it, and it, should, be, uh, it should be closer to 6% at least from what I hear. Uh, so that is a significant factor. I don't think there's a plan at least not on the table now, for how to fix that. And I, I would suggest that's probably the big thing to fix in the structure. Other areas of corruption, they do exist, whether it's in certain state-owned industries or whether it's in preferential contracts or preferential pricing that people take advantage of. Those, are, those all do need to be attacked, but I think the structural issue of the economy is critically important to getting the economy going in the right direction. Governor, so far as thank you, I'm Jim Gilmore from uh, American Opportunity Free Congress Foundation. Um, Mr. Ambassador, so far everything that's been talked about feels very isolated, and I guess my question is, how does this fit into the the big picture of what the Russians are trying to do? Uh, if you look at the uh, Ukraine, the annexation of the Crimea, the activities in Syria, the cyber attacks, the pressure in on Eastern Europe, the danger to the Baltics. Uh, the question I have for you is, does this, is this part of a pattern? Uh, because it, it made me ask, you said in the statement, well, they're, they're not coming, going any further in Ukraine. They, they're, they are where they are. They can't get any more. I don't know why you would say that. Uh, if they're objective is an expansionist policy like traditional Russian policy is, why isn't this just a piece of this and how does it fit in your view, if at all? Um, one specific point, and then I'll um, take it broader, but just to your point about why they couldn't take more. Um, the Ukrainians would not sit for it. Um, they, they couldn't physically take more territory without losing uh, troops, equipment, um, any any kind of um, relationships in the world, and the Ukrainians would not they would not accept uh, a Russian takeover. What I think Russia really wants is to change the government in Ukraine to get a more friendly government, and I think they kind of blown it um, by what by taking the territory they took, and they, they have to start thinking about how to unwind that. And to the broader point, though. Putin has staked his leadership in Russia on restoring Russian greatness, uh, making Russia great again, I guess, um, which uh, has, first off, an issue about respect in the world. It has uh, power. It has territory. It has the territories of the former Soviet Union are special. Uh, and it has being at the table in, in all major global issues. So I think those are the elements of power that Putin is trying to amass. And he needs that in order to justify a very authoritarian rule at home. So that's, what's, that's the, how it fits together. And I think when you look at the many of the things you touched on, uh, whether it's Syria, or whether it's protecting Russian speakers in uh, Ukraine, or whether Crimea, or whether it's uh, saber rattling around the Baltic states and talking about Russian communities there, or Georgia, or Transnistria. These are all periphery of Russia, all trying to create instability on the borders that gives Russia opportunities for influence. And I think that is what they've been trying to do. What I hope is that we can rally ourselves both the U.S. and our, our allies in Europe, 
to demonstrate resolve, ability to defend ourselves and our allies, to deter further moves, and then to build success. And I think it is not lost on people in Russia that the Baltic states are doing well. Uh, and Russian communities there don't want to be part of Russia. <laughs> They're quite happy being in the Baltic states. Uh, I think that we, we do want to see Ukraine be successful. They are not as successful as they should be. I think that would also be a very important thing for, for Russia. But what we hope is that um, Russia can recognize that we, stability can be in its interest, resolving these conflicts can be in its interest. It can still compete for hearts and minds of people around through all the usual means, uh, which we see everywhere, RT, Sputnik, cyber attacks, energy, corruption, bribery, business deals, everything. They'll keep doing that. But the, the military conflicts are actually self-defeating. That's what we have to, to try to convince them of. Right down here, sir. <clears throat> To what extent in your negotiations are you finding that the government in Kiev doesn't really want to resolve this? Because you talked about the costs on the Russian side of the ledger, but in many ways this is a plus on the Kiev side of the ledger, right? They're getting foreign assistance, which the government has lived off of since its, since its independence. The more the fighting continues, even if, if they don't lose more territory, the more they're going to get the backing of the West. Um, so do you see a reluctance on their part to get this territory back, to get to resolution? Because ultimately, getting it back means attention dwindles, foreign assistance dwindles, and they have a large territory that they're going to have to feed. Um, no, is the answer. Um, I find them very focused on this and very determined. They, it, it's not a huge territory and it's not a, a huge number of people. It's maybe eastern Ukraine is about 4% of the territory of the country. Um, if everybody lived there, it would be about 4 to 4.5 million people, so maybe 10% of the population. Um, but there aren't that many people there now. It's probably under 2. And they desperately want to get the territory back. Uh, because uh, what I described is that the political dynamic in Ukraine, the public is un unwilling to accept that you can just be invaded and lose this territory. And that applies to both Crimea and eastern Ukraine. Uh, there's no willingness to accept the loss of either one. In fact, maybe Crimea is even more sensitively felt. But I don't detect any, any lack of determination or, or will at all. I do detect uh, a A very uh, demanding approach from the Ukrainians. Uh, we're, we're not, they don't want to have to compromise on things that they would have to do because this, they view this as their territory. Why should an outside power tell them what they can do inside their own country? So they're very, very reluctant to negotiate on, on, on things. That's, that's hard. Um, the Minsk agreements did impose on Ukraine a few political measures that they accepted. They didn't have any choice. They were defeated militarily. They, they needed to have a ceasefire. And so this was pushed on them. But now they're there, and uh, they are prepared to implement them when they can. But they're not going to be pushed into a situation where they're doing everything and Russia's still doing nothing. Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, you said that the Russians want a friendly government in Kiev, that that's their objective. Uh, what is the definition of a friendly government? Uh, what does that mean? Maybe pliant. Uh, pliant is maybe a better word than that. And if sometimes one hears that the Russian concerns at the strategic level with regard to Ukraine is for it not to join NATO. Uh, <coughs> are the Ukrainians, in order to have their 
territory restored and their sovereignty restored. Willing to, uh, what price uh, other than, you know, willingness to resist indefinite Western support, willing to pay to achieve that? Uh, is it, you know, remember our friends Big used to talk about finalization as a solution, as an option possibly. God bless him. Um, there are people who talked about the Austrian model, uh, not necessarily uh, analogous. Uh, uh, there are also even Finland Plus options. Uh, 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 is there any, uh, first of all, your evaluation of this idea that uh, a bottom up approach may not? ultimately produce the results that we want it has to be a grand bargain so to speak and whether the Ukrainians are willing to accommodate to any of these alternatives uh, in order to uh, to achieve uh, restoration uh, and uh, I, I leave aside the issue of the US policy and merely focus on what uh, the Ukrainians uh, might or might not be willing to do. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, it's not in the U.S. gift to negotiate away the choices that a sovereign country is going to make. So that, I think that's right. Yeah. But from the Ukrainian point of view, it's actually the opposite of what you're, you're positing, that before they were invaded, there was tepid support for NATO in Ukraine. Um, since then, it has gone up considerably, and may even be a slight majority now. Uh, so the, the effect of having your territory taken is to cause you to want to defend it, <laughs> as opposed to be, being willing to accept that you can't. Um, so that's, that's been a, a very dramatic reaction in the in public uh, opinion. And then another thing that I think is worth pointing out, uh, because it connects to your question, even though it's not what you were asking, but it connects, is we often get lost in the Russian narrative uh, about, um, well, Ukraine should never be a member of NATO. But remember that the cause, uh, or the, the proximate cause of the conflict in Ukraine was connected to EU membership. It wasn't about NATO. There was, there was no request and there was no offer. <laughs> it was not there. Uh, it was about the EU, where the government of Ukraine at the time, Yanukovych, withdrew from talks with the EU about an association agreement. And that brought out protesters to the streets who were shot. And that then brought out bigger protests and um, a vote in the parliament to remove him as president and he fled the country. Um, that's sort of what, what sparked everything. And then it was after he fled the country and was in Russia that a few months later, I think it was three months, four months later, Russia developed its plans, put in the little green men, as we called them at the time, into Crimea. Uh, cut it off from the rest of Ukrainian territory, <coughs> orchestrated a referendum, uh, which was basically vote for fascism, vote for us. And then as soon as that vote was done, said, okay, well, we're, who are we to, to thwart the wishes of the Crimean people, so we'll take them as part of Russia. Uh, it all happened in the space of about six weeks, which was remarkably fast, and no one was prepared for this. And because it was so easy, then they, they got started again in eastern Ukraine, and it wasn't so easy. Uh, so I think it's, it's recognizing that the connection here was the EU, and then the opportunistic response to Yanukovych fleeing the country and wanting to restore, if you will, a, a Yanukovych-type figure who would, be, who would be positive for Russia, as they saw it. Uh, that's just not in the cards anymore. I can't see any of the current presidential candidates, including the one of the opposition bloc, which is the former party of regions, uh, Boyko, 
even he is required as a matter of public presentation to clearly assert Ukrainian nationalism and a demand for the restoration of Ukraine's territory. Your judgment about Russia's culture as if they, uh, Ukraine was willing to choose one of the other options for itself uh, in exchange for restoration. <coughs> Is that something that Russia could, uh, could welcome? Well, I don't see Russia willing to talk about or consider giving back Crimea. <coughs> So I, I don't think that's that's not on the table from the Russian point of view right now. Um, and I also think that these things have all been initiated by Russia, uh, whether it's Georgia or Moldova or Ukraine. Um, with with you know they, the the narrative has grown up after the fact as to why. <laughs> but the reality is it was a, is a Russian policy to do that uh, for uh, what, what I would say is, is uh, putting it more succinctly than I did the last time, it is asserting a role over Russian-speaking people wherever they are, asserting a special right of say-so over the territory of former Soviet states, and asserting a place at the table in all global issues that matter. Uh, so I think it's that exercise of power. That's, I think, what has driven this. So I'm not sure that uh, looking for devices like that, well, if we make a commitment like this, it's going to change that. Dimitri? <coughs> and I agree with practical everything. I agree with practical everything you said. And uh, I also know uh, I was in Moscow several days after a meeting with Turco. I do know that uh, the Russians now have uh, uh, a grudging respect for you. I do remember that when I, uh, your appointment was first mentioned, and they said on Russian TV uh, that it probably was good news. They did not quite denounce me. But uh, how to put it delicately, they were more than a little surprised. Now uh, I hear from uh, senior Russian officials when they speak publicly that they take your mission very seriously. They do know that you are very tough-minded, but they think that you are a straight shooter. And very important. They think that you are influential. That's for the good news. <laughs> I also think that your analysis is quite good. I agree with you completely that Putin does not want to annex uh, Donbass. Uh, he is not acting like he wanted uh, to annex Donbass, and I agree with you, it would be very costly for him to do it in more ways than one. I also agree with you completely that the Ukrainian army is much stronger, and the Russians take the Ukrainian army much more seriously, and they do understand that particularly with anti-tank weapons, and whatever else the United States provides, the Ukrainians can offer a much tougher fight. The problem is, for me, but I do not know what Putin will decide to do after the election. It's very clear, as you said, that now they are buying time. But we do not know uh, who is going to be the foreign minister after the elections, who is to, to going to be Putin's foreign policy assistant. And uh, these people, my impression is, don't know themselves. Everybody expects some kind of a foreign policy review. And some think that uh, Putin is going to do, uh, quote-unquote, the right thing, and uh, would uh, try to find some way to get out of the bus in return uh, for easing of sanctions and perhaps some assurances, some assurances of Ukrainian NATO membership. It's quite possible. But there are also other voices which suggest that Putin is buying time because he does not want to acknowledge that his policy is facing a dead end, uh, that uh, they are not accomplishing the objectives in Syria. They are not accomplishing the objectives in Ukraine. They were humiliated to, uh, with uh, the Olympic Games. That he may draw very different conclusions. And one conclusion he may draw in the case of Ukraine uh, is not to accept uh, uh, additional concessions. 
but to decide as some people in his government suggest uh, a very different way against Ukraine as they are, to, to, as they are saying uh, giving Baghdad to Kiev with everything that is associated with that and with a kind of warfare for which Ukraine does not seem to be very well prepared do you think that this is possible? And if you do think that this is possible, what do you think the United States will do about it? Mm -hmm. Thank you for all of that. Um, I agree, we just don't know what, what they're going to do. If you're in Putin's shoes, the big issue is what happens after the election. Winning is not the issue, it's now what? Because he's, it's on paper, it's the last term of him as president, filling out 24 years. Um, and people will start wondering, people will start asking, is he going to change the Constitution? Will he change, will he create a new position to take? Will he pick a successor? What's going to happen? And it's, it's that, answering that question about uh, what his role is, what the future of Russia's political system is, is, is critical. And I think that will drive a lot of the decisions. And we just don't know how that's going to go. The, um, the prospect of increasing the conflict, I believe, is just too costly for Russia, even if you're talking about asymmetric warfare and in Kiev. So I just don't see it. Uh, I think that it's a much more resilient country than anyone expected. <laughs> I, I, I literally, I think Russia expected, and I think maybe a lot of people in the West expected, Ukraine didn't have a sense of identity, it wouldn't fight back. It, it's not actually the case. And um, Kiev is actually more energetic and dynamic um, and, um, you know, youthful in a way. You, know, you feel movement in Kiev like you used to feel in Central Europe in the 90s. It's, it's got that, that vibrancy about it. Uh, so uh, I don't think you could do that uh, in Kiev or in uh, Ukraine as a whole. What I could see is Russia simply deciding, you know what, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. And uh, people often ask me, so what's your plan B if Russia decides just to keep occupying the territory? My view is that plan B is plan A which is get Ukraine as successful and healthy as possible. That, you know, a successful Ukraine is the goal. And um, if they c can get their territory back, that's important. But if they can't get their territory back, that's still important. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you so much. Um, Christina Wong from um, Breitbart News. Um, can you, can you tell us the latest on the status of decisions on the UN peacekeeping mission? Is it just a matter of um, scope and um, boundaries? And, and secondly, if you could talk about the impact of the administration lifting the restrictions on lethal, lethal defensive weapons, um, you know, how has that changed negotiations, if at all? And, and have, you, have they been delivered in any major way yet? Thank you. So on the um, defensive arms, um, it hasn't really changed anything. Uh, in terms of discussions and negotiations. Russia vastly outnumbers Ukrainian capacities. Uh, they on three sides surrounding Ukraine. They have over 100,000 troops and you know, all the associated equipment. Even in eastern Ukraine, there's about 30,000 troops, mostly contractors, run by Russian, by Russian military forces, and hundreds and hundreds of tanks there. So. They know, the Russians know full well, this is not an offensive capability, it's not a game changer militarily, and Ukraine will be nuts to try to attack Russia. Uh, so it just not hasn't changed anything there. And as a result, it doesn't really play into discussions either. Also, there was a lot of fear in the past that by moving ahead on defensive arms, that allies would object to this, and that did not happen either. On um, the state of play on discussions about a peacekeeping force, uh, all of us, Russia, US, France, uh, UK, we've all said we don't want this discussion to get going in New York unless we're in agreement on the key principles of what we're trying to do. You know, just starting drafting when you don't agree on the goal is going to be 
And the US, France, Germany, UK, Canada, Sweden's on the Security Council right now, um, Poland is as well. We're all in agreement on what a peacekeeping force ought to be. And the key principles are it's got to have responsibility for control of the territory, so area security responsibility. It's got to be able to oversee the containment of heavy weapons. And it's got to have control of the Ukrainian side of the Ukraine-Russia border. Uh, Russia, in September, proposed something very different. They proposed a UN protection force, uh, which would only have responsibility for protecting the OSCE monitors and operating only on the ceasefire line, not all the way to the border, not in the, in the territory. Uh, no one, not Ukraine, not the Western community, the Security Council members own, can accept that. that that's, the, that's furthering the division of the territory rather than integrating the territory. But we did view it as an opening for discussion. And for a couple of meetings with the Russians, we had some good exploratory sessions. Uh, in November, there was really a step back and they went back to the original proposal. The most recent meeting that we had it was much more constructive again. We were talking about how would you actually get to a real peacekeeping force that met those criteria. And what we talked about is a recognition of you know, military and logistic facts. And you can't deploy a peacekeeping force across an area that size in a day. It's going to take time. You'll probably need to do it in stages. And uh, what the Russian side said is that's actually very helpful to think of it in stages. And that you could even think not only in terms of geographic stages, but in growth of the mandate. As the peacekeeping force grows in capacity, its, it's mandate would grow. So, well, that's certainly imaginable as well. The only thing that is critical here, though, is you can't have additional decision points along the way. You can't be waiting to take the next step because there's something that has to be fulfilled. We have to have agreement up front from start to finish. And that's the state of discussions as we left them. We have to see what Russia now comes back with. We are here. Um, Ambassador, uh, you said that um, you wanted to increase the clarity in terms of how um, we conceptualize the conflict, um, and so that uh, emphasizes uh, Russian agency uh, uh, and de-emphasizes this as a civil war. Uh, that's seen as politically incorrect to, to name it such. What is politically correct is to name it as occupied territories. Um, what I wanted to know is, is there a danger in perhaps the reality not conforming to our kind of moralized understanding of the conflict that is actually in amongst these people, two million people, which is a large, large group of people, there may be people who um, are very alienated because of the fact that Kiev has attacked them, because they've lost relatives, uh, because of the war. The war itself is not an ethnic war, but the war itself changes people, and it uh, gives people um, motivation to fight against what they see as their enemies. So you presumably have some kind of sense of public opinion in these uh, de facto states. That's what I study for a living. Um, the, the research that had come out on the Donbass, it's difficult to do research in, um, in these areas, in occupied areas, uh, but the research has shown that, uh, and this is German research from Zeus, uh, is that the, amongst the population there, there's greater adherence to Russia as a consequence of the conflict. Now that may be an artifact of the particular circumstances, but what is your um, kind of appreciation of the fact that if there is a peacekeeping force that goes in there, some of the people are not going to be too happy about the fact that uh, this peacekeeping force is going to try to take down entities that they have relatives in, that they have uh, a, you know, a support for, um, 
and there is also going to be a significant portion of the population um, that are not going to be happy about reintegrating into Ukraine. And I base that on research that I've done in the other de, de facto states where the majority of the population in those areas um, does not want to be reintegrated into their uh, parent state. So Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Transnistria, uh, and of course Nagorno-Karabakh. Sir, we missed your identification. Would you tell us? I, I'm uh, Gerard Toll. I'm a professor at uh, Virginia Tech in Alexandria. Thank you. So, I'm glad you brought up the other conflicts, uh, South Ossetia, Abkhazia, and so forth, because there, there is a basis to that conflict that existed independently. More so in Abkhazia than South Ossetia, but in both cases you could identify it. There is no such thing in Ukraine. Uh, and it, it, it's not just politically incorrect to call it a civil war, it's factually incorrect to call it a civil war. It isn't. Um, and you have um, people of ethnic Russian background, Russian-speaking people throughout the entire country. Um, there's no pressure on them there. You have ethnic Russian, Russian-speaking people in the Ukrainian military fighting to keep the territory or to to hold the line against Russian forces. The military operation is 100% Russian command and control, from two-star commanders down to the company level, uh, embedded officers who then command contract forces that are hired and paid for by Russia, um, and with Russian military equipment brought in. So that's, that's the physical nature of the conflict, and there isn't an indigenous basis to it. It's only there by Russian creation. The economy in the area has largely collapsed. Uh, it had been a rust belt of heavy industry, but still producing. Um, a lot of this has just fallen apart now. Uh, mines are flooded, uh, steel plants shut down, coal plants shut down. And one of the only employers is Russia now because they created these entities and they created these military forces and they're paying people and so that's what they've established. So in a way you have a point that yes, if, if Russia pulls out, that's sort of the only thing left that's employing people. But on the other hand, you have the opportunity to get back to normal life. I'd also just make an illustration when you talk about public opinion. As you said, it is very, very hard to gauge. Um, in December, Russia decided to remove the president of the so-called Luhansk People's Republic by sending forces up from Donetsk. And this is someone who allegedly had been elected uh, in that area to this entity. And there's not a peep from anybody uh, in Luhansk or Donetsk or anywhere else. It, it, people didn't care whether this person was in office or removed because they have no affinity or association with it at all. They, uh, they, they don't view it as uh, legitimate or having any connection to them. They view these entities as basically uh, war profiteers who have power who then Im impose on the society. And they just want to get about their daily lives as best they can. Many of those people, most of those people have relatives who have left who are then working elsewhere and trying to send money back. And so they're not bereft of information about what's happening in where they are and also what's happening in the rest of the world. Uh, I think that there had been uh, a deep frustration with the government in Kiev before the conflict and, and a great affinity with Russia. I think there is much less affinity with Russia now, but a continuing deep frustration with the government in Kyiv. Uh, and I think that's probably where they, where they stand. The government in Kyiv needs to do a much better job of acting deliberately to, to make clear that it views the population in these territories as Ukrainian citizens, that have rights, and that it should be doing everything possible to support them as best they can. And uh, that is, you don't always get that posture uh, articulated from the Ukrainian side. Right here.
Hi, I'm Abigail Williams with NBC News. I just wanted to follow up on my colleague's question about the delivery of lethal weapons and find out at what state that was, if there had been delivery and what the, the composition of that was. And then I wondered if there had been any recent changes on the ground as far as um, Russia, Russia's presence, if there's been an increase or decrease in particular areas, or what the general outlook on that is at the moment. Uh, no further information on, on the state of deliveries, I just don't know. Um, on the Russian presence, a few years ago there were more Russian soldiers and units that were directly involved in Ukraine. And Russia has, over the past couple of years, done a very good job of professionalizing the operation. So they've been able to reduce the number of regular Russian officers to really the officer corps and the commando and some specialized units, uh, such as in electronic warfare. And the rest is contract. Uh, and so it's become a, a better organized and, and more professional military operation over time with a smaller footprint of regular Russian officers than had been. Uh, to what, what do we need to know about his role and uh, uh, how much he is just a and how much uh, he is somebody uh, who is involved in I don't know the answer to that. Um, what I can say is that Wagner is the company that is hiring and organizing the contract soldiers for the military operation. Um, my, my assumption about Russia is that many people are involved in decision making, but only one person makes decisions. <laughs> Here. Oh, I'll, so much. I'll, I'll, I'll ask one. Uh, I'll just, I'll, I'll project my voice. So, Kurt, we were talking a little bit, a couple of questions ago uh, about the uh, the occupied regions of eastern Ukraine, and I, I guess as I try to think about that problem from a, a practical perspective. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, we all hope, as you can imagine, that you succeed in your mission uh, and find uh, some kind of an agreement that restores uh, that territory uh, to Ukrainian control. Um, I guess what I'm really wondering is, uh, uh, after that uh, success, uh, what, what comes next? Uh, uh, you know, there's a region that has been uh, really devastated. Uh, 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 it, it will be quite difficult, uh, even in the absence of fighting for the people who live there, to go about their normal lives. Uh, and I can envision a, uh, uh, a situation in which the government in Kiev would face some pretty difficult uh, choices about where to spend its limited resources. Uh, and uh, th those could be kind of thorny uh, political problems inside Ukraine if you're asking the Ukrainian parliament uh, to, to make a decision between spending money uh, to rebuild this uh, liberated territory uh, versus spending it to help people in other parts of Ukraine who may feel that they have uh, also great need and uh, uh, probably that they're more deserving uh, too. Uh, do you think the, the Ukrainian government is going to be able to handle a situation like that? And do we end up uh, actually potentially with a, a kind of a new and different conflict later uh, if they can? Um, it's a fair question. Uh, because there will be competing priorities for a budget, as always. Uh, the Ukrainian government is very acutely aware it's going to have to work to reintegrate the territory. It's not, it's not going to be easy. And likewise, uh, the European Union, and in particular Germany, are also very aware that it's going to require outside support and outside financing. Um, 
there are rich Ukrainian businessmen, you might know. <laughs> and um, I'm sure there are a couple of them who would love to get back into Eastern Ukraine, but they would probably need some structural financing to do that. And so I, th I think that the intention is there, uh, but they've got to be able to get the territory back first, and then cross that bridge when you get to it. Question here on the right. Thanks. George Beebe from the Center for the National Interest. Kurt, thanks for your, for your remarks. Um, uh, I, I want to zoom out a little bit on this from Ukraine and look at the, the situation in Europe more broadly. Um, I think one way of understanding what's gone on with uh, Russian military activities over the past decade is the Russians have sent very clear messages that our conception for Europe, whole and free, um, is something that they're not willing to buy into. Um, and my question is, um, zooming back uh, 15, 20 years and looking at what we were envisioning uh, Europe to look like, what, what security order would prevail, uh, is that still viable given what's going on? Um, can we still aspire to a Europe whole and free uh, or do we do we need to make some sort of an adjustment given uh, what the Russians are, are saying and doing? And if so, what would that adjustment look like? Well, I guess I would think of it this way. Why shouldn't Europe be whole and free? And people get to make their own decisions as the basis of that. that countries um, should be able to decide their own fates and their own futures and not have somebody standing over them saying they can't. Uh, so uh, you know, I, I think we, we obviously, sh in my view, should continue to stand for that. Uh, we have to recognize that nothing happens overnight. Things take time. And it's largely, as it was in the case of Central East European countries, they had to do the work. You know, they had to build their democracies and their institutions and their economies. And likewise, you know, Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, they are going to have to do that too. And a Europe whole and free was never a vision that was intended to exclude Russia, but it was to set out principles that these are the sorts of things, freedom, democracy, market economy, rule of law, human rights, um, security, and being part of a larger space that should apply to Russia as well. Uh, it's up to the Russians to make that choice and, and realize that in their own country. So I don't think we should be against it. I think we should be for it. We should be patient. I think we've got a question back in the Hi, uh, uh, David Johnson with uh, Janus Global. Uh, I want to go into the Europe thing a little bit more. A, a big part of your being as successful as you have been has been European cohesion, both on the, on the sanction side of things and the political leadership. So is um, Mrs. Merkel's recent travails going to have any impact on that? Uh, and secondarily, would the is, is there been any, any broader impact from the... Uh, the material in the Mueller uh, indictment last week that had to do with uh, potentially former uh, European politicians lobbying on behalf of uh, the former Ukrainian government. Thank you. Yeah. Um, on the uh, question about the indictment, um, no, I haven't seen any impact of that. Um, not surprising, and uh, I don't think it's going to have um, much impact in, in terms of how European governments are making decisions. The former question about Merkel, that's interesting. It does seem as though the grand coalition will get another four years. So we'll see a lot of stability in German policy. It has been already um, a compromise between uh, a CDU chancellor, uh, which is uh, somewhat more conservative uh, in outlook and, and more Russia skeptic, and an SPD foreign ministry, which has been a little bit more engagement oriented towards Russia. And I think that is likely to be what we see going forward. Just one factoid is kind of interesting though. In the document negotiated by the SPD and the CDU, CSU, uh, it actually put in German support for a peacekeeping force in Eastern Ukraine. So it, uh, it's interesting that that's there because it means that they talked about it and they agreed on an approach, uh, which is actually 
more than had been the case uh, prior to that. Right here. <coughs> Uh, David German from the Center for National Interest. Well, I just wanted to George's question, and you kind of touched on this too earlier. Um, you mentioned that the Russians, uh, well, there was never an intention to exclude the Russians from uh, you know, post-Cold War security structure, and uh, Bill Clinton made an effort, I guess, in 1994 you know, to do that, uh, but separate from NATO. Um, if you manage to get all this resolved, how do you prevent something like this uh, from happening again? How do you get the Russians integrated into the transatlantic security structure. I mean, what's your vision for that? I mean, how do we prevent this from happening again? Yeah. Well, first of all, it has <clears throat> stories of what Russia wants to do. Uh, right now, Russia wants to uh, be uh, attacking and taking ter territory from its neighbors. Uh, that, that's not going to go over. So it starts with Russia's intent. The second is that we have a really good framework for this already, uh, which the Soviet Union agreed to. Uh, which is the Helsinki Accords. And the, the 10 key principles listed in the Helsinki Accords are still really good ones. Uh, no changing borders by force, no interference in the affairs of other countries. Every country has a right to choose its own uh, security orientation, its own political system, and so on. So I think what we should do, I think Russia accuses the West of violating those in the case of Kosovo. And we see Russia as uh, violating that in the case of you know, Georgia and Moldova and, and uh, Ukraine. And I think if we could all agree that actually those principles are still good principles and we should all stick to those and try to build on those, I think that would be the right way. We have two questions right here. The one on the left. Yeah. Uh, Matt Rajansky from uh, the Cannon Institute of Wilson Center. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, as usual, just lucid and to the point. Really appreciate it. Um, so last week, uh, I and some colleagues, uh, Mike uh, and others, were, were in Israel, and we heard from the Israelis a tremendous amount of concern about this new law in Poland, about sort of Holocaust history and so on. This is a, a roundabout way to get to a question about NATO, which I know has been a big part of your life, so let me ask it now. And that's, you know, the relationship with Russia sort of runs through a prism of transatlantic relations first and foremost for the United States. And that's not a relationship we build on kind of pure interests. We build it on a foundation of common values and common outlook and, and principles, uh, the rules-based order being one of those. Um, are there any canaries in the coal mine for that relationship in terms of what's happening now in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, in Ukraine, and you know, for those of us who think yes, of obviously we see echoes of what's been happening in Russia for a long time. But I'm wondering on how you sort of wrestle with that, given that you know you have a lot of experience with with NATO, and we need that common position to talk about. Well, that's a really big new topic, <laughs> and uh, my view on that is. We have in Western societies a couple of problems that we're all experiencing. We have a popular frustration with elites who've been governing, feeling that the elites have not been doing a good job, or for whatever other reason. That's also combined with a rallying around um, national identity of some kind because of threats from outside, whether that's refugees or jobs or, or whatever it might be. And they're interrelated in a way because the way that many elites, most elites in most countries have dealt with them is to double down on telling the public you're wrong. And the public doesn't take that very well <laughs> and it creates this claim. In a couple of places, uh, and you mentioned Poland for instance, and you could throw Hungary into the mix as well, and maybe coming up soon in Italy, um, you have governments that have, and one would argue here about you know the, the way that President Trump was elected on the back of a, of a different kind of movement, um, where the publics have gotten people elected that they feel are going to be more in line with these issues of concern and identity that they are worried about. What I think we need is rather than looking at this as well, those of us in the civilized West have really got to deal with the bad children. We, we actually have to look at it as 
we need to do a better job dealing with our publics to make sure we're addressing what they care about. <laughs> so, and that is something that affects all of us, not just a couple of cases where the government's flipped. Um, that's kind of the way I would, and how I would view it, if, you know, from a NATO perspective. I wouldn't be finger wagging at countries in NATO. I'd actually be encouraging reflection among all of us. And how do we how do we deal with this phenomenon? We we need to be willing to address the refugee issue. I'll, I'll give you a concrete example. The SPD in Germany uh, is at its lowest point. You know, it used to be in the 40% range, and now they're down on 20 something. And that is largely because of their inability to speak frankly and deal with the refugee issue in Germany. Uh, the, pu the public is fed up, and the SPD, because of its policies, can't grapple with it, and so it's collapsing as a party. Thanks. I think that's a pretty good place to stop. That's a very broad thought. You have, uh, I think, covered this with as much as a subject, with as much clarity, with as much intelligence as I could possibly put And I thank you, sir, very much. So thank you for having me.